Hello, church, and welcome to our kitchen. Um, I am especially excited about what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, my, uh, I think my favorite part of worship as a kid, my dad being a pastor and just kind of running around the pews as a kid of the Presbyterian Church, were the sacraments. So as we're talking about the different parts of worship over the last many weeks, I love the sacraments. So what are the sacraments? If you're a Catholic, you're thinking there's seven of them, but the Protestants, we believe there's two, uh, baptism and communion. And on Sunday, by the way, I will be baptizing June Kwa, and he's uh, getting married to Amy Newberry. Uh, and June has never been baptized. I'll baptize him in the pool after church. And then the next week he gets married, and he will celebrate communion um, at at his wedding, at his marriage. So it's like June is being super sacramental. Um, but why did I love him so much as a kid? Well, I think the main reason is it wasn't deeply theological. It's because generally you got to get up out of your seat and, and out of your pew and do something. There was activity. I loved activity. It could have, you know, involved splashing and sprinkling, uh, eating snacks, um, Passing little cup, hoping you didn't drop the big silver tray with all the little glasses that I thought I called shot glasses, and my mom would roll her eyes. But I loved um, that because it felt like a field trip in the worship service. Like you got to do something. You didn't just have to sit. You got to respond. And for sure, the sacraments are my favorite part of being a pastor. Baptizing and looking you in the eyes and telling you, that Christ's body was broken for you and his blood shed for you. I still love the getting in the pool. I love the juice. I love the King's Hawaiian bread we use uh, at, at uh, uh, communion. I love all those things. But I would say that those two sacraments have done probably more for my faith in Jesus than almost any other part of the, of the worship service. And we call it a sacrament because it's a ritual. It's something we do, a holy ritual. But it's also called an ordinance because Jesus um, ordered them, commanded them, said, hey, do these things, right? Eat this bread, drink this cup, be baptized. Uh, and so today, my hope is to kind of convince you, if you're not already convinced, how vital the sacraments are to the life of the worshiper, to the life of the disciple, to the follower of Jesus. So I'm going to pray and we're going to get into Acts chapter 2. Lord Jesus, I say it every week and I, I believe it that this world does not need more Nate Stratman, not more illustrations, um, not more personality. God, we need you. We need your living spirit. We need your direction. God, we need your word. We need you to unify us in this world, God. We, we, of course, long for your peace as we watch the news. And we do not have the ability to do those things, to bring about peace in this world. But, God, we believe you do. And so, God, fix our ears, our eyes, our hearts. Attach them to you, Lord Jesus, this day. And we pray in your loving and holy name. Amen. So, in our church service, if, if you're there, you would hear uh, Luke 22, which is the Last Supper, and Romans 6, two different passages. Romans 6 is about baptism, the two sacraments. But I'm going to do something different. I'm going to actually use uh, Acts chapter 2, which is the Pentecost section. And so maybe uh, you can pause this, open your Bible, uh, your phone. But I'm going to kind of summarize a lot of Acts 2, but if you want to follow along, I think it could be helpful because I want you to think through a certain lens. I want you to reflect about your own journey of faith, how you became a Christian, um, or maybe be thinking through the lens of someone you know who's curious about the faith. But we're going to look at that pattern of faith of how one becomes a Christ follower. So Acts chapter 2 is Pentecost. They're in the upper room. The disciples are in Jerusalem. Same room where the Last Supper took place. And long story short, but the Pentecost is when I wear those red pants that people call pink, but they're red. But the Holy Spirit essentially fills the disciples, fills the believers. And all these miraculous things take uh, place. It's the birth of the church is what we call Pentecost. Um, and so when you think about your story of faith 
or conversion, whatever word you want to use, or if you think about someone else's, this is what you have to remember, that God made the first move. God always moves towards us first, long before you ever had a clue. So when I baptize little ones, I always say this, they have no clue that God is at work uh, drawing them unto himself. We, we're not aware of that. I, I wasn't fully aware, aware of that. But when you look back on your story, I, I can look at signs and go, oh my gosh, the spirit was at work, tilling the soil, you know, stirring things up. Seeds were planted. You can look back, right? Most of our theology is formed looking back over our lives and we go, oh my gosh. And now it might look different, but that is part of every Christian's story is that the Spirit made the first move. Like when we became aware of faith, it's not like God was invented at that moment. No, God has been at work for a long time forming you in your mother's womb. You just didn't know that. So in Acts 2, the Spirit is at work uh, in a mighty miraculous way and the stage is set, right? So God got their attention for what? I would say for the preaching of the word. And so Peter, I love this. Peter stands up, the guy who's made all these mistakes, he stands up and he preaches this banger of a sermon, right? He's talking Old Testament. Uh, he's using the prophet Joel about what God says about salvation and for people to get right with the Lord. He's, he's talking about the Psalms, what David said prophetically about Jesus. And then he starts talking about Jesus. He starts talking about the gospel message. And he says, verse 36, Peter says, let all Israel be assured. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, but he made him both Lord and Messiah, right? Master and Messiah. So again, in every Christian story, if you are a follower of Jesus, in your story, if I root around and ask, I can see the spirit at work. I can, can see that. But there is a message and there's a messenger. So in today's story, the, the, what we're looking at next too, the messenger is Peter. And the message is the good news of Jesus Christ, that he uses both Old and essentially New Testament to let people know. Now, I think the message is always the same. It's in the sense of the content of, of the, the basis of it, but the creativity varies. And when it comes to messengers, uh, if you think of your story, there was probably not one messenger, there were multiple messengers. But the third M, when you think of there needs to be a message, there needs to be a messenger. But the third M when it comes to like conversion in Christ is timing. It's the moment, right? There is a message, a messenger, and a moment, and that varies. So for me, in my story, my parents and others, they scattered seeds. You know, whether I heard them or not, they scattered seeds. And the Sunday school teachers that I thought were incredibly boring were scattering seeds. But the moment for me was a season in kind of my end of my college, which I've told you all before. I was confused. Uh, I didn't really know which end was up. Career stuff changed. Dating stuff changed. Everything was in flux. And that was the moment. And there was a primary messenger in that moment. And it was a guy named Hunter Hall who chose to sit in the Sigma Chi house at 618 West Maple, Fayetteville, Arkansas, and just eat lunch with a bunch of 19, 20, 21, 22 year olds as a dad with young kids to get to know us. But, but for him, that place was his post. As, a, as an agent of God's grace, Hunter just showed up day in and day out, earning trust and pointing to Christ. So I want to stop here for a second. In your journey, who were the messengers? And on Sunday, I want people to really tell me, who were the messengers? What were their names? I would say Hunter was, a, was one in that moment. And how was the message told? Was it crammed down your throat? Was it an invitation? Was it gracious? And then what made it the right moment? What was going on that made you be very aware of the presence and goodness of Christ? I would love for you to think through those things. And as you're walking with someone else, think through those things. So back to Pentecost, we're working through this story. 
You have this message. You have this messenger, Peter. You have this moment of the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. And everything is right. So verse 37, it says, when the people heard this, they, when they heard the message, the preaching, the gospel, the word, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Right? We've heard all this goodness. What should we do? And by the way, they weren't cut to the heart by good or slick preaching or awesome slides or, you know, any of that stuff. They're cut to the heart by the gospel message. The truth, the truth is what moved them so deeply to say, what do we do? And often Christians will say, okay, uh, get them a journal. Uh, I, I, here's an email of a pastor or read this book or uh, go to my Sunday school class. You know, we're, we're studying tithing. You know, what do we do? Well, what does Peter say? Peter said, well, here's what you do. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then it says 3,000 of them accepted that message, right? They were baptized. So at some point, you heard the truth. It cut to the heart, to the soul. You took a good look at your life, your situation, and you repented. Greek word metanoia, changing of the mind or a coming to senses, which I love that kind of definition. You come to your senses about this life and you say, I, I can no longer head this direction. I got to make a U-turn and walk towards Christ and walk there with boldness, knowing I'm forgiven. So baptism, which is what he asked them to do, told them to do, repent and be baptized, it is an outward sign of what God is doing on the inside of a person, which we don't always know what's happening on the inside of a person, but it's an outward sign of it. So for them, the baptized person, the truth of Jesus has become evident. They've come to their senses, right? They've made the U-turn, and they've made a public commitment right, in front of others, in front of the church, to Jesus. So as June is baptized this Sunday, as I, I take him in the pool and I baptize him, he goes down in, in the sense you can think about the death of the old June, the old ways, right? We, we are baptized and that's what Romans talks about, the death of Christ. We go down, but as we come up, it symbolizes resurrection, Right? We are brought up into new life in Christ. And that's where those great words that Paul says, in Jesus Christ, right? you, June, Nate, you are a new creation. The old, that's gone. The new, it's come. That's the beauty of what you're coming up to in, uh, in baptism. So is baptism the finish line? No, and that's why I get frustrated if the goal is, let's just get everybody baptized. Bring your towel, jump in the pool. No, 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 no. Baptism is not the finish line, not in this story, not in the grand narrative of God. So what do baptized people do? Well, if you keep reading Acts 2, I love it. It gets to this famous section of Acts 2.42, and it said the baptized people devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Okay, now hear me. Baptism is once and for all. I can explain this if you want to come talk to me, but we don't do double dipping at our church. It's once and for all. But baptized people regularly read scripture, gather together with other believers, regularly pray, and then they break bread. Now, there's been discussion of what does that mean? Well, I, I believe this whole section points to breaking bread in the community standpoint, like fellowship, let's break bread together. But I also think it's communion, that Jesus asked us to take the bread to the cup to remember him, to celebrate the Eucharist, which I always tell you it means to give thanks. And so at the table, as we come to the table, we not only uh, remember what Christ has done, but we proclaim the saving death of the resurrected Lord. It's a proclamation. It's looking backward and it's looking forward. So if you keep reading these baptized communion taking folks in Acts 2, there's all this fruit. Right? God is blessing their socks off. There is oneness. There is unity. There's not division. They're sharing with the poor. All these beautiful things are happening in this community. 
They were vibrant. They were imperfect. And they were growing rapidly. So what I want you to think about as we talk about sacraments, what I love is they are the visible gospel. So I can literally, when I think about communion and baptism, I see myself in the upper room at the Lord's table. I can see myself sitting with the guys, right? And the same with baptism. I've been to the Jordan. I can see myself being baptized with others. And so what happens is this visible gospel that we participate in, they stir up our faith. And you know as well as I do, our faith can get stuck. But there's something about the sacraments, I think, that lift our heads up, that help us participate or see ourselves in this gospel story with with Christ. Um, Sacramentum, where we get the word sacrament, it was a a non-spiritual word. It was used by the Roman army. And essentially what it meant was a tattoo or a marking that they put on a Roman soldier. And it was a reminder of what unit they belonged to in the army. Baptism and communion, sacraments, they are reminders of who we belong to. And you know as well as I do as well that we can forget who we belong to no matter how long you have been seeking Christ. The other thing is that sacraments are all about grace. I mean, grace, grace, grace upon grace, right? Augustine said this, and the other theologians keep talking about this idea of this visible sign. We do it out front for others to see, for us to participate in. We can see it, but it's a visible sign of an invisible grace, a grace that we can't quite grab. And so the reality is that for many of us, grace gets forgotten, that we forget grace. And so it is the bread, it is the cup, Um, It is the water that are material signs that remind us of God's grace. And so in baptism, it's this idea that God's grace is covering us, right? I like to use a lot of water with a little one, or, or I love the dunking that water. It covers all, every bit of us. And then communion, it's like grace is in us, ingesting grace, digesting grace. I love that image. Now, sacraments do not save us. This is why, you know, sometimes people say, oh, this person, you know, is sick and and run and take and take them the elements and and this idea that these things will save us. and, And I just don't believe that. Presbyterians don't believe that. But they do point us to the one who does save us, and that is Christ. I also would say this. I, we do not believe that the bread and the cup are the literal body and blood. But I will tell you something. I believe something holy and mysterious happens at the table and at baptism, and I can't quite explain it. It's almost like the Holy Spirit feels especially present, that faith is stirred up, which is what sacraments do, and that this transmission of grace is just all over the place. I I just believe that when we have baptism and communion, that my sermon, it it, it doesn't matter if I preach a dog. It's just that when we can participate and come to the table, it's like, this is the sermon. This is the best sermon. For me, it's a powerful moment that that something is going on and the Spirit is at work. Now, the final thing is we don't do sacraments alone. You don't eat the bread and serve yourself the bread in the cup. You don't do a cannonball in the lake or the river or the pool. Jesus didn't baptize himself. He sure could have. So this is why I don't do a la carte baptisms. People say, hey, would you run over to the house and baptize so-and-so for me? You know, and I, and I don't. I'm excited that something's stirring in you, but the reason why I don't is because I believe you're baptized into community. Not on your out here on your own terms doing your own thing. Even at weddings when people want communion, you know, I'm not a huge stickler, but I really prefer that, that communion is offered to everyone and not just the two people. Now, I know it gets hard when you say, gosh, three-fourths of the people at this wedding are not Christ followers, and I get that. But there's something about when we, when we share community that we do it with the community of believers. Um, You know, sacraments are deeply personal. They're very personal to me, but at the same time, they're communal, right? They're not private, they're personal, and they're communal. So it's this idea when you walk towards the table, you should look at the other people in the other line walking to receive the elements and going, you need him too? Yep, me too, bud. Yeah, okay, let's go together. And we're walking down together 
to receive these elements to remind ourselves of our need for Christ. The same with baptism. When I, and when we've been baptizing in the Risley's pool or at the ocean, I love as a pastor that I look out and I see your faces. And it literally stirs the church up. The spirit is stirring the church up. Kids are watching. Everybody's listening. There's smiles. There's excitement. Because there's this new life in Christ. Why would you not be excited about that? It makes others want to be baptized. It pushes some of us to remember our baptism, saying, yes, we've been baptized. We want to live into that baptism. And for non-believers, they're watching us baptize and take communion, and they see these visible signs of the gospel, right? These visible signs of Jesus' overwhelming grace. And those sacraments, they bind us together as a church, as a community, through the death and resurrection of Christ. I want to say this, um, if God is stirring in any way about baptism or communion, right, for yourself, for your kids, for whoever, your friend, I, I would love to talk with you. Um, please, please, please let us know. Email me, Nate Stratman at HopeForWilmington.com. <laughs> I'll give you my cell phone. You probably already have it. Let's talk about it because sacraments are some of the most beautiful ways that we can respond to the persistent and overwhelming grace of God through Jesus Christ. So I tell you this, the water is ready. Jesus has set the table and he says, come, come to me. Let's pray. Lord God, um, we thank you not just for the sacraments, but we thank you for what you have done that what cause us to celebrate the sacraments, that we get new life in you and that you yourself, you were baptized. And before you did really a thing, the father says that he's pleased. And it shows so much, it's not about what we do, but it's about what you do and have done and are doing. And so we thank you, Lord God, and we thank you. Um, for the grace we receive because of your sacrificial gift of your life. And that wasn't just for us, but you did that for the world. And we're grateful for that, Lord Jesus. And so we respond. We're always responding to the word, the written word, the incarnate word, you, Lord Jesus, we respond. And in these ways, we respond with baptism and communion. And we're grateful for these outward signs of an inward grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Glad you could join us. Have a great week. Next week, we are uh, wrapping up the series, talking about being sent out into the world as we talk about the benediction. Okay, have a great week.